Amen. All right, we're there in John chapter number one. Uh, John chapter one is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. I think it's a very, especially the beginning is a is very beautifully written, very poetic opening. Um, what I want to do is I want to focus on or start at least um, on verse forty three. John one, verse forty three. Now I think this is kind of interesting because you have this uh, you have this story. Let's start reading. Um, in verse 43, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. So Jesus is calling his disciples here. The, the chapter opens just with this poetic uh, description of who John the Baptist was, who Jesus Christ was. Uh, it opens up with John the Baptist and the baptism of Jesus Christ. It's a very exciting, uh, very upbeat tone to John chapter 1. And now Jesus is calling his disciples who are who are uh, eager to follow him. Verse 44, Now Philip was of, Be- was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him. So Jesus is calling all these disciples, and they're going and they're telling other people, they're t- telling their brothers, their family, they're following Jesus. Um, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So just a very happy, upbeat tone here. And I feel like in verse 46, the chapter kind of comes screeching to a halt here. Verse 46, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And here we see this optimistic chapter kind of comes screeching to a halt here with this, um, with this, this very pessimistic tone that kind of stands out where you have Nathaniel. Nazareth must have been known as a bad area, must not have been known as a very great area part of town or a very great part of the country because here you have Nathaniel who has someone tell him we found the Messiah we found the Savior and his reply can any good thing come out of Nazareth Philip saith unto him come and see so we're not really going to be looking into the story too much but it is kind of setting the tone for what we're going to look at this evening this evening the title of the sermon is the spectrum of perspective and what I'd like to do is take a few minutes and look at uh, perspective. We have optimism on one side, pessimism on the other. What should we be? Should we as Christians be optimistic? Should we be pessimistic? Does it depend on the situation? Does it depend on what we're going through? What's the balance? Should we be all of one or a balance of both? Um, what, what should we be? Turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter number 3. This, this, I love this. The reason I open with this, this, these verses here is you know, one proof alone that the Bible is not written by man, that it was inspired by God, is I don't know if there's any other book out there that captures the hu- human nature as well as the Bible. If the Bible was written by man, it would not capture the downside of mankind. It would not capture so well um, just the nature of man, and just the nature of, you know, everything from the fallen state of man to just man's pessimism and just every little avenue of The nature of mankind, the Bible, captures perfectly. So this evening, we're going to look at pessimism, we're going to look at optimism, the dangers of both, and the correct balance. So let's start off with pessimism. What are the dangers of pessimism? Here's some things you can watch out for with pessimism. What is pessimism? Pessimism is defined as a tendency to stress the negative or unfavorable or to take the gloomiest possible view. So let's look at a couple issues with pessimism, a couple things we should watch out for with pessimism. Let's make an argument um, against it this evening. The first thing is this. You're in Exodus chapter 3. One thing about pessimism that is a danger is that pessimism can stem from a lack of faith. If you're there in Exodus chapter 3, uh, here we're talking about the story of Moses at the burning bush. Moses has, This is when Moses is called by God. He is, he's standing at the the bush that is on fire and is not consumed, the Bible said. And look what God is saying to Moses, verse 9. Now therefore behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up unto me, and I also have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore. So God is giving a command to Moses. He's saying, you know, I see what my people are going through. I see the oppression. I see the they're in slavery. I, I hear their cries. And his action is, come now, therefore, and I will send thee into Pharaoh that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So here God is calling um, the prophet Moses, and he is telling him, I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to tell him to let my people go. 
And Moses' response is in, uh, turn to chapter 4, look at verse 1. Just flip a page over. Exodus 4, verse 1. And Moses, I'm sorry, verse 9, my, my bad. Verse 9, And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. This is some pessimism here from Moses. Here God is telling him, Hey, I want you to do this. It's going to turn out great. Just don't worry about it. And Moses says, They're not going to believe me. It's not going to work. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. Okay? And so what happens now, basically in between, is where God basically tells Moses, of all the miracles, God, God's still being patient with them, and he's saying, okay, don't worry. Um, I'm going to have you do this miracle and this miracle, and you're going to go. And, and that way, both the Pharaoh and the elders of Israel will know that I have sent you. That should be enough for Moses. But verse 10, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, he uses another excuse here, I am not eloquent. He says, I, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not good at, uh, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't pass my public speaking class in high school. Neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am of slow, of slow of speech and of a slow tongue. So God kind of shoots down his first excuse. And so Moses, still sticking to his pessimism, kind of rolls right on to the next thing. He says, well, well I can't talk well. I, I'm, not, I'm not a good speaker. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, So here we see God kind of get frustrated at Moses here. God says unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the, du the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? So God tells him, I'm the one who made your mouth. I'm the one who, who designed the mouth. Who are you to tell me that yours doesn't work good enough? Verse 12, Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And just as a side note here, this isn't really part of the sermon, but just as a side note, this, uh, you know, not everyone, some people are naturally good, um, at, at speaking. Some people are naturally good at, at interacting with other people. I feel like that was always a weakness of mine. I'm kind of an introvert. But you don't have to worry about using this excuse as a soul winner. Uh, you don't have to turn there. But Isaiah 28, 11 says this. This is God speaking. For with the stammering lips in another tongue will he speak to this people. You don't have to worry about, uh, I, can't, I can't speak or I don't have, I'm not good with words. You have the Holy Spirit and God promises that that's enough. But, aside from the point, I digress, Moses is being pessimistic here. And you say, why is he being pessimistic? His pessimism is stemming from a lack of faith. That's why Moses is doing this. That's why he's being pessimistic. He doesn't have the faith. He has all these other reasons. Look, there's a time to think logically, and we're going to look at that this evening, or in a little bit here. But in this moment, where God is telling him, you just need to trust me, I'm telling you, it will work, it will be fine. There's no reason to be pessimistic here. Turn to Numbers 13. Look, God gave us a brain. God gave us common sense. He wants us to use it, but not to the point where we doubt the infinite power of God. Amen. We need to be careful with that. Numbers 13, this is where God is, is sending the, the 12 spies into the land of Canaan. God has promised them in this land. He is, God didn't make a mistake here. God didn't forget to look up the demographics of the land. He didn't forget to uh, do a census on how many people live there. God knows what he's doing, and he wants them to go and just search out the land. Verse 1 of Numbers chapter 13, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. So there's 12 spies. One was from every tribe, representing every tribe. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men were heads of the children of Israel. Skip to verse 25. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came unto Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent, uh, sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Now, keep in mind here before we continue, I want you just to understand that they were not sent into the land to, to give everyone an opinion. God had already told them it would work. God had already been telling them for generations that this is the land they would, that he would give them. They were sent there to 
you know, scope out the land, to maybe draw a map, or to kind of just get a better idea. Because obviously God fought their battles, but he still expected them to do the due diligence of showing up and fighting the battles and having enough faith to do that. But they were not sent there to give an opinion. Verse 28, Nevertheless, nevertheless, these spies are speaking to the people, The people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled. That shouldn't matter. God already gave them the land. There's no reason for pessimism here. And very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea, and the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people. So notice, they're just panicking people. It's, it, you can tell, already tell by the fact that Caleb is having to still the people. That means he's having to calm them down. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But, now the men are arguing with them, but the men that went up with them said, We be not able to go up against the people. That's some serious pessimism here, and it's stemming. Why? Why do they have this pessimism? Because they don't have the faith. We be not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. And then just to make sure we get it, uh, the, the, the narrator of the Bible here clarifies, and they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, and then it gives us some more context in what they said, the land which we have gone up to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw are men of great stature. And then here they, they're so pessimistic, they start to use, um, they start to blow things out of proportion, which is usually the case. And they, there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which are come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Look, we understand there was giants. The Bible tells us there were giants in those days. Okay, they weren't, it wasn't like Jack and the Beanstalk where they were 500 feet tall. Okay, they were maybe 9, 10, 11 feet tall. But by ratio, were they, were they grasshoppers? Were they grasshoppers in the side? No, they weren't. This is them blowing things out of proportion. They're trying to convince people against what God has already told them he has given them. They're being pessimistic. Now look, from a military perspective, I'm all with them. From a military perspective, that's what they're doing. They're, they're saying, uh, you know, we're, we're not able to do that with, with our... But look, God trumps military strategy, especially in this case. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 4. While you're turning to Nehemiah 4, I'm going to read you a few verses from John 20, where Jesus has risen from the dead, and he has appeared unto some of, some of his disciples. And you have Thomas. He's already appeared to some of the disciples, but the Bible says in verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So all the disciples have seen Jesus at this point, except for Thomas. It says, The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. He's being very pessimistic here. And after eight days, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas. So, obviously, God is all-knowing. He knows the one that, was not, that did not have faith. And God singles out Thomas here. And part of me believes, I don't know this, this is my opinion, but part of me believes that maybe this is the reason God on purpose maybe was testing Thomas. That's why he wasn't with him the first time. I, I don't know. It's just, I get a feeling from that. Because notice how he singles out Thomas. He says, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. We need to be careful, because pessimism can obviously arise in us because we lack the faith. They're there in Nehemiah chapter 4. So what's the danger of pessimism? What's the problem with pessimism? Well, the first problem is that it can stem from a lack of faith, and we need to watch for that, and we need to be careful. There's a time for pessimism, and we're going to see that uh, in, a, in a minute here. But us not having faith is not a time for it. But here's another problem with pessimism. Pessimism can be used to discourage works for God. There in Nehemiah chapter 4, look at verse 1. Of course, you have the context in Nehemiah is this is af after the captivity. This is decades after the captivity. And the, the Israelites, the Hebrews, are returning back to the land of Israel to build the walls and build the temple and, and kind of rebuild everything um, a, a generation later. 
But you have enemies. You have enemies that do not want them to build the wall. You have enemies that don't want them to do this work that God has commanded them to do. Verse 1, But it came to pass when Samballot heard that we built the wall. So this is Nehemiah speaking. Uh, he, Nehemiah wrote the book of Nehemiah, and he's speaking uh, kind of first person under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Heard that we built the wall. He was wroth. That means he was angry. And took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, Notice the pessimism. What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Amorite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. So they're just to the point of being ridiculous. They're using pessimism. He's saying, oh, if a fox, a fox could push over your wall, your building. They're just, they're, they're using pessimism. Why? This time it has nothing to do with a lack of faith. This time it's solely being used to discourage works for God. Yeah. And we need to be careful of this because this can happen with ourselves, with us doing this to ourselves. We are being pessimistic. To, in discouraging works of God for ourselves, or we are allowing other people to do it to us. You don't have to turn there, but I'll read to you Nehemiah 4.11. It, it kind of, this is later, but it, it kind of it, it reiterates why they're doing this. And our adversary, adversary said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. These are enemies of the Lord, and they did not want this work being done. So they're using pessimism to discourage. Turn to Isaiah 36. Isaiah chapter 36. And especially in a group like a church where uh, everyone's striving together to uh, serve the Lord, this can, be, this can become a cancer. While you're turning to Isaiah 36, I'm going to read you part, a couple verses of the story of Gideon. You have the Midianites that were oppressing the children of Israel, and God chose a man named Gideon to go against them. And the Bible tells us the Midianites had an army that it, it was, you couldn't even count it. It was so big. It stretched as far as you can see, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people in this army. And God has chosen this man, Gideon, who is already greatly outnumbered to fight them. The Bible says in Judges 7, 2, you're, you should be in Isaiah 36. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for, thee, for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So God says, you know, there's too many people, Gideon. I don't want you to win the battle and think that it was because you had strength. He says, I'm going to whittle your numbers down so much that when you win, you're going to know it was me. Verse 3. But notice God removes most of the people, but God is very tactful with how the, the, who he chooses to remove. Verse 3. Now therefore go, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. So the majority of the people leave, but notice God says, here's who I want. I, I, I want to remove a majority of these people. I want you to find everyone that's scared and afraid, and I want them to go home. You say, why? Because if you have a group of people serving God, Especially in this Christian life, this is a good example because we are vastly outnumbered. We are vastly outnumbered. And when you have a group of people serving God, if you have people that are pessimistic, that pessimism, even if their pessimism is from a lack of faith, their pessimism can discourage the work of God that the rest are trying to do. So God says, if you're fearful, if you're afraid, we, we don't need you. Go home. That's harsh, but God understands that these people he, he has, he needs them to be strong. He needs them to get a job done, and he cannot have pessimism ruining that. We'll look at one more example of this. You're there in Isaiah chapter 36. Here, this is when Assyria is threatening the nation of Judah. They, are, they, are, they had just attacked Israel, and now they are at the walls um, of Jerusalem to attack, to attack this city. But notice the tactic. They don't just go and invade the city right away. Notice what they try to do to, to win over the city an easier way. Isaiah 36, look at verse 13. Then, then Rabshakeh, so this is, a, this, is not, this is a messenger, like a general uh, of the Assyrians. He's not the king. But notice what he, said, he does. 
Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. So earlier in the chapter, we are told that he was specifically speaking to the people, not the king. If he was speaking to the king, he'd send a messenger. He's speaking to everybody here. He's trying to get the people's attention. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for notice the pessimism, he shall not be able to deliver you. So what's he trying to do to weaken the people? As he goes and he uses pessimism. Don't, don't trust Hezekiah. Everything Hezekiah has told you, it's a lie. It's not going to work. He can't deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. So he goes to them. And look, you've got to be careful of this, because as a Christian, people are going to come to you in your life. Maybe they're not going to directly say this, but in a roundabout way, I can promise you, they will use pessimism to say, don't trust in the Lord. That life you're trying to live, it's not going to deliver you. It's not going to work. Don't let that happen to you. And look, it, it can be, like I said, it can be the pessimism of other people attacking you. It can be pessimism of other people trying to utilize this as a weapon to get you to stop serving God in any capacity. But we can also, if we're not careful, we can let it, we can do it to ourselves. We can let our own pessimism hinder us from doing great works for God. So just beware, because this will be used against you. Whether it's from a lack of faith or it's being used uh, to stop us from serving God, pessimism can be a danger, and we need to be careful of it. But what about optimism? You say, okay, the, uh, I'm scared of pessimism now. I'm going to be the most optimistic person ever. Nothing's ever. I'm, I'm going to be super optimistic all the time. This is a problem as well. What is optimism? Optimism is defined as a tendency to expect the best possible outcome or dwell on the most hopeful aspects of a situation. So you say, we well, can't go wrong with optimism, right? Not quite. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 5. So just like we looked at two problems or two potential dangers with pessimism, we're going to look at two potential dangers of optimism, two, two areas that optimism can actually get us into trouble. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 11. Here's the first problem with optimism. Optimism, potentially, can cause us to ignore the judgment of God. You're there in Jeremiah chapter 5. Here, God has a problem. In Jeremiah, of course, Jeremiah was not the only prophet that did this, but in this particular time frame, in this book, you have Jeremiah preaching to the, to the nation of Judah in particular, he's preaching to them about the captivity that would have one day come from Babylon. This is kind of what, in general, this is kind of what he spent his life preaching on. He talked about other things as well, but this was kind of his main mission. And you had a problem with people going around kind of denying that this was happening. Of course, people don't like to hear bad news. People don't like to hear they're wrong. Jeremiah 5, look at verse 11. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. He's saying they're in sin. They, they are not. They, they have turned from me. Verse 12, they have belied the Lord. Belied meaning to give a false representation of or to misrepresent. So they're, they're essentially creating a false reality of God. They're creating a false uh, uh, picture. They're misrepresenting what God actually thinks. And said, it is not he. Neither shall evil come upon us. Neither shall we see sword nor famine. So you have these people going around, and we know that there were prophets, false prophets, that were kind of inspiring this in people, but this idea was spreading of, God wouldn't do that. Does this sound familiar today? God, God wouldn't, I don't believe in a God that would send people to hell. I don't believe in a God of judgment. This is what they were saying. They wanted to deny that this was happening as a result of their sin. And so they're, they're denying it. They're being optimistic. They're saying, I don't think God's like that. I don't think God would do something like that. They're using optimism here. Verse 13, let's see what God thinks about this. And the prophets that, that tell them this shall become wind, and the word is not in them, thus shall it be done unto them. Then we have the famous verse, Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Because ye speak this word, behold, talking to Jeremiah here, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. I was not very happy about this. 
See, but, but they're being optimistic. They're looking at things in the best possible light. Look at verse 22. Look how mad God is about this. Verse 22, fear ye not me. God sees their optimism, and you know what God says? He says, you know what? You don't fear me. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it? And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet they cannot prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Look, when it comes to the judgment of God, because we're saved, meaning we're not going to go to hell, but we do face the chastisement of God if we sin against Him in this life. And look, the chastisement of God, the judgment of God, in that area, optimism can destroy us. If we choose to take utter optimism, and we deny that we've done wrong, or we deny that, that we've made mistakes, it will get worse and worse and worse and worse for ourselves. We need to be careful about that. Zephaniah 1.12 you don't have to turn there, says this, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lees, that say in their heart, The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. And obviously this applies to individuals, but th this applies to, I kind of put, I, the judgment of God I kind of can put into three different, I, I'd like to think about it in three different areas. You have indiv saved believers, there's, there can be judgment from God and just the form of chastisement of the believer. But then there's also the judgment of the unsaved, hell. And it's the same concept there. How many people have you run into out soul winning? Uh, oh, I, I don't believe God. I, I, I'm a good enough person. They're, taking, they're using optimism. Everyone uses optimism in this area. I, I'm pretty sure I'd make it to heaven. They don't know for sure, but what side do they, they lean towards? I, I think I'd make it. I think I'm good enough. I don't, I don't think God sends anyone to hell. But look, not, with, not just with unsaved, but you know, this also applies to a nation. That, that's the particular instance here in Jeremiah, in, in Zephaniah. It's a nation, and God's punishing or getting ready to punish a nation for their sin, and it's, it's, it's just make, getting worse because the people are in denial. They're being too optimistic about the judgment of God. They're saying, they're, they're, not, they're, not, they're escaping reality. They're saying it wouldn't happen. To kind of demonstrate this, I want to read you a quote, okay? You know, this is obviously... I'm reading this quote to show the wrong mentality we should have. But I'm going to read you a quote from uh, the great statesman and heretic Mitt Romney. Okay? Mitt Romney said this once, quote, It's fashionable in some circles to be pessimistic about America, about conservative solutions, about the Republican Party. I utterly reject that pessimism. That mentality right there is what will be the downfall of America is that you have, this is an area we should be pessimistic. When it comes to the sins of our nation, look, I, I believe our, our nation was, was founded on, on good principles, and I believe that it was, we messed it up. I believe that it was, it was moral at one point, and then you know, we, allowed, we, we allowed corruption, and we allowed everything. We, we kind of took that inheritance and ruined it. However, we, we need to be pessimistic about America. If we want, if we want the hope of, of getting right or, or fixing our problems as a country, if that's even a possibility anymore, we need to be real about the problems we have. If we just ignore our problems and say, no, we're fine, we're fine, we're, God, God bless America no matter what, that's, that's going to destroy us. I, one thing I just thought about now is even the, um, the Star Spangled Banner, which is our national um, anthem, in, I believe it's the third or fourth verse, there's a, I, I forget how it's phrased, but there's a, there's a phrase in there that says something like, God, God will bless, God will bless our, our, our efforts if our cause it is just. Even, so even then, it was understood that even John Adams would say that, you know, you need a moral, you need, this constitution, this government, it's only going to work for immoral people. It's only going to work for immoral and religious people. But if we take the state of our country today, in the sin we're in, the, the filth that we accept, if we, if we go with Mitt Romney here and we reject all pessimism, we say, you know what? It's fine. It's fine. Everything's great. As, as everything's burning around us, we're like, this is, this is wonderful. God, God bless America no matter what. That is what will be the ultimate destruction of our, of our country. We're not going to get anywhere. You can't escape. You can't Jonah this. Yeah. You can't run away from God 
You can't act like the judgment of God isn't real and hope it works. It's, it's no different with, I, 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 it, it saddens me many times because you go soul winning and you run into someone who, you say, do you, you know, you know for sure if you go to heaven? Oh, no, I don't. Do you want to know? No, I'm fine. I, I'm, I, I, I'm good. I don't want to talk about this right now. Some, some people will say. I, I, I don't want to have this discussion right now. And it saddens me because I, I look at this person and I think to myself, where else would you apply this in life? You have a major problem here. You don't know if you're going to heaven. And so your solution is just to ignore it. Yeah. Not think about it. I, I'll just put, put it on the back burner. It's no different with, with the judgment of God in general, whether it's us as the chastisement of God as saved believers, whether it's a nation or whether it's someone who's unsaved, ignoring the judgment of God and being optimistic about it and acting like it's not real will only make it worse. Right. So, dangers of optimism. The first thing that we learned is optimism can ignore the judgment of God. But here's another thing we can look at. Optimism, turn to Matthew chapter 4. Optimism can tempt God. It can tempt God. Turn to Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. Here we have the story of Jesus who is, right before he begins his ministry, he kind of goes through the trial where he is tempted of the devil. The devil tests him with, and tempts him with, with various things. He's trying to get the, the sinless Son of God to make a mistake because Satan knows how salvation works. If Jesus Christ was not perfect, then there's no hope for salvation. If Jesus Christ was not perfect, then when he died on the cross, he would be dying for his own sin. He could not die for the sins of the world if he was a sinner himself. Verse 5, so here we see one of the things that he does. Then the devil taketh them up, this is really interesting here, taketh them up into the holy city, the Jerusalem, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. This is a real verse here. This is in Psalm, Psalms. This is a real verse. This is a real promise from God. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So what does this mean? Because here you have the devil pull out a Bible verse and quote a Bible verse to Jesus and says, God has promised that he will protect you. God has promised that he will give his uh, angels charge over you. you got angels are protecting you, Jesus. Cast yourself off the temple. And here Jesus counters this and says, Yeah, however, it also says... You should not tempt the Lord that God. So how is this tempting God? The devil's being optimistic here. He's saying, God, God has promised. God has promised that he'll, he'll, he'll protect you. Jump off. Here's why this would be tempting God. Here's what I kind of want to focus on, because I think a lot, of, a lot of people can miss this. There's a lot of promises in the Bible. Just, just to name a few, there's the promise God will provide for us, food and raiment. There's the promise of safety, safety is of the Lord. Salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. There is the promise that if we go soul winning, we preach the gospel, we will bear fruit. There is the promise that if someone's seeking the truth, they're going to find it. But all these promises have something in common. The common denominator in all of these is that to some extent, they all require our input. Let's think about this. Imagine if you went through life with utter, utter optimism when it came to the promises of God. For men, let's just think about go through the first couple as men. God, what if we said, God will provide for me, and I've seen people who do this. I've seen men who do this. God will provide for me, so I'm not going to get a job. God has promised he'll provide for me. Or what if we said, safety is of the Lord, so I will take no steps to protect me or my family. I'm, I'll just gonna take careless risks with my life. God, God's promised. God pro safety is of the Lord. God's promised me. Or what if everyone else, what, what about the mentality of, of, you know, everyone, I think everyone goes to heaven. A lot of people say that. I, 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 that's an optimistic take. I, I, th I, think, I think everyone just kind of, no, no input of their own, no decision they have to make, n n nothing, nothing on their side is automatically everyone saved. A lot, a, lot, that's, a lot of people think that. No matter what religion you are, everyone, God, God said, I don't believe in a God who would send people to hell. Or, thinking, what if, what if a believer told themselves, you know, if someone's seeking the truth, they're going to find it. 
So I'm not going to go soul winning because they'll find the truth anyway and they'll get saved anyway. Almost this, this partially Calvinist mentality of anyone who's looking, knocking at the door and seeking for the truth to any extent, they're just going to get saved somehow. Somehow God, they will get saved. So why do I need to preach the gospel? You see where I'm going with this? All these things, even salvation. Look, salvation is a free gift and the whole, it, it, everything's already paid for. But if we don't make, at least put the input in and to make the decision to trust Christ, we are not saved. We cannot be saved. God does not save you automatically. A, a, a human has to make a decision to trust Christ as their Savior. It goes with all these things. Let's think about a couple examples in the Bible. The biggest one I can think of is the, the Israelites promised with the promised land. We kind of already looked at it a little bit. It was a conditional promise. God, God promised them he would give them that land, but it was not unconditional. And look, this is a huge misunderstanding. This is why the majority of, uh, of mainstream Christianity today still thinks that the nation of Israel is, God, God gave that to them. God gave them that nation. God, God promised throughout the whole Old Testament that he would not, that they, they, if, if they were not serving God, he, he removed them from the land. If they were not serving God, if they were not right, they went into captivity. And somehow a nation that still rejects Christ as their Savior. Look, look the, the Jews need to be saved just like everybody else. They need a Savior just like everybody else. Paul said he wished he could, he could, uh, he, he could exchange his own soul for, for the Jews. However, they, they still reject Christ and they're still unsaved. And to, to, there's a whole bunch of people out there that, that think that it was just apparently an unconditional promise, but that's not how it worked. It was, if you serve me, if you keep my commandments, then I will, I will bless you with this land. Turn to 1 Samuel 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. And look, this is why, I mean, we, we already apply this to every area of our life in some extent. This is why we have jobs. This is why we have jobs, because it's still our duty to provide for ourselves, our families. It's still our job, our duty to go soul winning. And look, if we don't, if you don't go soul winning, look, I, I do believe that if someone's knocking at the door and they're seeking the truth, God will, God will lead, into, you know, lead them towards a soul winner. However, if you don't go soul winning, there are going to be a lot of people over your lifetime who are seeking in some form that are going to go to hell. Because God was going to lead them to the truth, but it was your job to do it, and you never did. So these are all promises, but we still must do our due diligence. Think about Gideon we talked about. Think about all the times in the Bible that God said, I'm, I, I'm going to win the battle for you, I'm going to fight for you. But was there ever a time where they, where the, where they just sat and did nothing, and then God just miraculously fixed the problem for them? No, they had to, even if it was only 300 men, they had to have the courage, they had to go to battle, they had to put their armor on, they had to go out, get themselves in an array, they had to swing their sword, and then God, God won the battle for them. This is why we have jobs, this is why we go soul winning. This is, that's why there's a first aid kit in, in, you know, in the AV room here, just as a very small example. Because, just because God promises us these things, doesn't mean that we don't have responsibilities or he doesn't want us to at least have the faith to follow him on, on those things. Think about this. Think about if you had a boss that was training two people to do a, a task or a job. Think about what if he went to both of them and said, you know, I know you're just learning. Uh, I know you, you know, but I will make sure that you don't make any mistakes. I'll make sure I, I check your work. I'll make sure, I'll make sure as you're learning that you don't, you, nothing's messed up. I'll, I'll help you and I'll make sure that I will ensure your success as your boss. Now, what if you had one person that heard this and said, oh, well, I'm just not going to do anything then. I'm not going to try. And he, when his boss sees this person, is not, not trying at all, not even putting in the effort because he told me he'd take care of it. He told me he'd make sure everything turns out fine. What if he looked at the other employee who, although he's making, making mistakes, he's learning, he's trying as hard as he can, he's learning how to do the job, he's studying how to do the job, he's really putting the effort in, even if it's minute because he's just learning, he's really trying to do what he can. Who do you think that boss is going to help more? Who do you think that, he promised to both of them that, hey, I, I'm, I'll ensure your success, but who do you think he's going to really bless the most? He's going to bless the, the person who is taking their role seriously. He says, you know, I, I know, 
I have a job as a protector or a soul winner, a provider, or whatever it is, a follower, an employee. I know God has given me that role in my life, and he's ensured, he's promised me that he'll take care of me through that. He's not going to leave me hanging, but I'm going to take it seriously. I'm going I'm to try as hard as I can to, to show God that I care and I'm taking it seriously, and God will take care of the rest. That's the mentality we should have. And then in 1 Samuel 4, this is, a, this is a great example of this. Here the nation of Israel is in a bad state. They're fallen, they're rebellious against God, they're in sin, and as a result, verse 2 opens with judgment of God. And the Philistines put themselves in array against Israel. And when they joined battle, Israel was smitten before the Philistines, and they slew of the army in the field about 4,000 men. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, maybe we better get right with God. No, that's not what they said. They went with optimism. Wherefore, the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines, let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh unto us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So instead of getting right, they take this mentality of, you know, we're just going to go into battle anyway, almost with this entitlement mentality. You know what? God owes us victory. Look, God doesn't owe us anything. God doesn't owe you safety. He doesn't owe you protection. There is nothing God owes you. So even if something is a promise to you, just like God promised them victory if they obey him. Right. And we take this and we say, you know what? God, God just, God will just, regardless of my input or my heart or how I am spiritually, God will just do this for me. That's a pretty arrogant mentality to take to the creator of the universe. To think that God owes you anything. Right. Skip to verse 10. See how this went for them. Going into battle in sin, Ignoring God, daring to take the Ark of the Covenant and think that somehow it has some, it's going to do some magical thing for them. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they, they fled every man into his tent. Remember, 4,000 people died before. That's still a lot of people. But now that they doubled down on their sin and they got this arrogant mentality with God, it says, And there was a very great slaughter for their fill of Israel, 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of God, Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, were slain. In the, late, in the end of the chapter, we would hear the phrase, the glory was depart- of God was departed from Israel. Don't get, look, you say, but didn't they have faith? Didn't they have optimism? Didn't God promise to fight their battles? They had, the false, they had a false mentality. They had the mentality that a lot of us can get in different areas, and a lot of people can get that says, you know, just because God's promised me something, he just owes me that and I'll get it no matter what. That's not the right mentality to have with God. Don't, don't let... So what is tempting God? Tempting God is when you let yourself get in a, a, an entitlement mentality with God. Look, God has promised you to give his angels charge over you. But if you throw yourself off that temple, you're, you, you know what, you're sticking it to God. You're saying, you know, you owe me this, God. You owe me this protection. It's not right. It's tempting God. Don't let your optimism tempt God. So, we talked about pessimism. We talked about optimism, the dangers of both. Turn to Isaiah chapter 50. Let's, let's wrap it up. I'm sorry. Turn to 2 Timothy 4. My bad. 2 Timothy 4. Let's wrap it up here. So, what's the proper balance? We understand there's some serious dangers of pessimism. We understand there's some serious dangers. Pessimism can let us, can let us have a lack of faith. It can stem from... Stopping, it can let us stop us from serving God. Optimism can cause us to ignore the judgment of God. It can even cause us to tempt God. Let's look at the right balance. Here's what the right balance is, okay? The right balance of optimism, pessimism for a Christian is this. Essentially, if you were to shorten it up, we should be pessimistic enough to be rooted in reality, but optimism, op- optimistic enough to know that once we've lost control and there's no more we can do, God takes care of the rest. We take our hands off the wheel. Saying in Timothy 4, this is kind of the last, many people think the last words of Paul, kind of his, him kind of wrapping up and summarizing his life. And we're not going to read the whole chapter, but up to this point, up to verse 16, Paul's just been, it's pretty pessimistic. He's been talking about all the people that stabbed him in the back, that left him, that hurt him, that, that, that caused him harm in, in some way or another, that left him, that abandoned him. Verse 16, at, first, at my first answer, no man stood with me. This is a pretty pessimistic, Paul. But all men forsook me. 
I pray God that it may not be laid, laid to their charge. That's, that's a great mentality to have with our enemies, by the way. Verse 17, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Here's some optimism. And strengthened me. That by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the, out of the mouth of the lion. Amen. See, what are you talking about, Paul? You've lived a life of, of betrayal, of, of persecution. There's a good chance that he is about to be executed, and he knows that. What are you talking about, Paul? How can you say, verse 18, And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Look, it's a balance. Because look, here's the reality. The Christian life is hard. If you're going to do it right, it's hard. Paul says, it was difficult. You know, I've, I've come across a lot of trouble. A lot of people hurt me. But in the end, God was on my side, so I still win. That's the mentality. Because you know what Paul realizes? Paul's a, I believe Paul's a very logical person. I believe that's why he was so effective as a soul winner, is he was able to go to people that didn't even, hadn't even heard of, of, of the God he was preaching, and they hadn't even heard of Jesus. And he was able to get down with them and, and understand their background and where they came from and, and be logical with them and, and convince them and exhort, and exhort them and convince the gainsayers. He was a very logical person. He was pessimistic enough to realize where he had to be logical. But at the end of the day, when he, he was able to identify where he no longer had control, where he couldn't change certain things, he couldn't change other people, he couldn't change the persecution that happened to him. So he was optimistic enough to say, you know what, in those times, God, God's got me taken care of. I've read the last chapter, I know who wins. Mentality. Even if I die on this earth, no matter what happens to me here, I, I still win. Kill me, do whatever you want to me. As long as Jesus Christ died and I'm going to heaven when you kill me, I've won. That's the mentality we need to have. In the end, God was on my side. So, just to recap, don't let pessimism grow out of a lack of faith. Don't let it stop you from serving God, both in yourself and others. Don't let optimism make you ignore the judgment of God. Look, if we, we all sin, we all make mistakes, look, we need to correct that as early as possible. Don't, don't let optimism push Play, play in our favor and push, push our faults out of the way. Don't let optimism get to the point where you tempt God, where you think you are owed things God, God promises you. So, in conclusion this evening, let's, just, let's, take, let's think about this. Let's think about the words of Paul here. I think this is really just the greatest example of this. Enough pessimism to be grounded in reality, but enough optimism to trust the Lord with the rest. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.